So this is the um, 12th annual update of um, diagnosis, prognosis and management of IBD from um, Best of DW. And this year, obviously, it's 2021. Um, this is basically about Cornerstones Health, uh, which is a medical education provider in the US, uh, who, uh, and Mala Dubinsky and David Rubin set um, Cornerstones Health up and have basically been committed to um, educating healthcare practitioners since its inception in 2008. Um, the Best of DEW program this year, like um, every year, um, has been developed by a team of um, IBD clinicians and researchers from around um, the world. And as well as that, we have a group of advanced IBD fellows and registrars who are critical to um, putting this all together. We initially um, review all the abstracts that are present, going to be presented at DW prior to the meeting and work out, uh, divide and up each of the sets of abstracts in order to make sure that the seven different groups have an even number and then we spend the meeting critiquing each of the abstracts and the posters and the talks and then we come together after the meeting um, for, um, as you can see here it was another virtual meeting again this year um, to and go talk through all the, the um, slides which have been put together by the fellows and um, try and work out which are the best abstracts we feel um, that should be then presented um, to all the different countries around the world. And um, Miles, Richard Geary and I do then also cull some of the abstracts um, uh, that we think may be less relevant to the Asia Pacific region and keep the key sort of um, studies, which is what you'll be seeing um, tonight. Feedback has suggested that we probably, that we have trying to fit too much into um, one a webinar. And so that's why this year the webinar has been split in two. I think this is particularly in the context of the virtual meeting. These are the um, faculty um, from around um, the world. And these are the fellows which um, do the lion's share of work putting the slides together once we've decided on which abstracts should be included. Medea Chima, currently works in Liverpool with me and Alex Turbane works with Miles in the Alfred and I want to make particular mention of those two that put in a lot of work. Uh, you will remember that DW is in the middle of the night for us from 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. so it's uh, particularly hard for them. Thankfully most of the talks were able to be viewed subsequently but still it was a lot of work um, for them. Um, <clears throat> These are the seven different subjects here which we'll be covering and tonight we'll be covering di the ones that are highlighted um, in bold, diagnosis, prognosis and prevention, current emerging therapies particularly focusing on biologics and then finally population health and um, epidemiology quality of life. Um, the three, we always try and think of the three take home messages we feel um, from each year's conference and this year these are the three. Firstly, CVU study which is the first um, head-to-head uh, -head study in um, bio-naive Crohn's disease looking at the effectiveness of use of kinumab and adalimumab which were found to be equally and highly effective achieving clinical remission at one year in bio-naive Crohn's disease. The adverse events including infections and discontinuation were numerically higher in the adalimumab group and we'll be discussing the view tonight. There are multiple studies looking at diet and Crohn's disease showing the association between processed and ultra-processed food and also the development and, and that association with development of Crohn's disease. But the dietary interventions, those which we'll be presenting next week, have so far been negative. Um, we're also, we'll also be discussing checkpoint inhibitor colitis tonight, and preliminary multicenter observational data suggests that betalizumab may be superior to infliximab with shorter duration of hospitalisation, less class recurrence, and potentially less cancer progression. So the first slide actually includes three studies um, which are around the use of processed and ultra-processed foods and the association with increased risk of inflammatory bowel disease. And I've, I mentioned at the top of the slide, uh, we have mentioned the difference between processed food and ultra-processed food. The first study on the left is a Canadian study called the PURE study, which stands for Prospective Urbanised Rural Epidemiology, and it's been conducted from 2003 to 2016 across 21 countries and including 116,000 participants aged between 35 and 70 years, and they have been given administered habitual food intake, um, food frequency questionnaires, which are country specific, <coughs> excuse me, 
and they've been given uh, the participants have been given uh, a minimum of three yearly these specific food frequency questionnaires which they've filled out and this particular study is looking at the incident cases of Crohn's disease and the association with processed food intake, um, there's uh, um, been so far at least nine years follow up, um, and so far there've been a 90 Crohn's disease um, incident cases and 377 ulcerative colitis incident cases. And um, you'll see down the bottom here that um, this shows you the association with total processed food intake and the number of servings per day of um, processed food. And you can see that if you have more than five servings a day, it significantly increases the hazard ratio of um, IBD and this is particularly the case with Crohn's disease as you can see less so with ulcerative colitis. They look specifically at certain ultra processed food and this, this association was found <coughs> excuse me specifically also with salty foods, sweets, processed meats and soft drinks and they and conversely found no association with Crohn's disease and um, ulcerative colitis with red meat, starch, uh, vegetables, fruit or legumes. So this is the first I suggest that highly pro high processed food consumption is associated with the development of IBD and particularly Crohn's disease. The second study in the middle is um, uh, using the data from the National Prospective Cohorts of the Nurses Health Study 1 and 2 and the Health Professionals Follow-Up Study with over nearly five and a half million person years of follow-up. And at this, again, pay, um, participants were also uh, administered food frequency questionnaires. And this looks at the um, incidence, uh, the association of the incidence of IBD and the intake of ultra-processed food. And in this particular in these particular studies, there have been 368 incident cases of Crohn's disease and 488 of ulcerative colitis. And like the first study, they found an association with um, high uh, ultra processed food intake and the incidence of Crohn's disease, which you can see on the left, including particularly ul uh, ultra processed grain foods and ready uh, and uh, fats and sauces. It wasn't um, there was an association, but it wasn't significant with sweet snacks. And also similarly, this is not depicted here, but also with the intake of emulsifiers and thickeners. This um, And so the high consumption of ultra processed uh, food, grains, fats and sauces and emulsifiers and thickeners has been associated here uh, and demonstrated here with an increased risk of Crohn's disease, but the same was not found for ulcerative colitis. The final study is called the Enigma study. It's been conducted in um, Hong Kong and Australia and includes Michael Cam's group in, Mel in Melbourne and Sue Ng's group in Hong Kong. And they've included um, 195 Crohn's disease patients as well as 53 first degree relatives, 89 of those IBD patients, 89 household members and 42 unrelated controls. And they've taken, they've looked at the um, early life processed food intake, so in the first few years of life, what was eaten um, in the first few years of life, and then looked at usual food additive intake over the last 12 months and the last three days. And in terms of early life, they found that um, this is looking specifically at Crohn's disease. The Crohn's disease patients in early life were more likely to have eaten processed meat, processed fruit, and consumed fast, more fast food than healthy controls and their first degree relatives. Um, uh, and uh, excuse me, sorry, <coughs> sorry. And interestingly as well, Crohn's disease patients, this isn't depicted here, but there was also um, an increased um, intake of food additives in the previous 12 months and in the prior three days uh, in Crohn's disease patients, patients versus controls. But I think this is particularly looking here on the right at the um, issue of early life consumption of um, highly ultra processed food and potentially this is being a trigger for a Crohn's disease um, uh, initiation. Uh, this slide um, is now is a um, looking at a prospective study that's been conducted in a single centre in Pittsburgh from 2009 to 2019 and includes uh, 4,215 patients. And this particular study is looking specifically at those patients with dermatological manifestation and describing these patients. So, 7.4% uh, of uh, this cohort had. Um, have dermatological conditions and 90% have one, 9% two, and 1% of patients have three dermatological diagnoses. And you'll see the pie chart in the middle showing what the diagnoses are. So eczema, 35%, 24% psoriasis, 
erythemia nematidosum 22%, 12% pyoderma ganquinosum hydronidase 6%, and 1% with pemphigus and bullous pemphigoid. What they found, um, and you'll see this on the on the right hand side, is compared to patients without dermatological manifestation, which is on the left, those patients with dermatological manifestations were more likely to be male. They were more likely to have aggressive disease. They had increased intestinal resection, more use of biologics, and also they were, had increased um, markers of disease severity. You can see it on the bottom, and also a biomarker such as eosinophilia and monocytosis. And this is summarised down here in the conclusion on the left. This is also a single centre study, but it is retrospective, looking at patients who've had a change in diagnosis from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease and what, um, what the features of these patients are compared to your ulcerative colitis patients and Crohn's disease patients and the numbers are indicated here on the top. Uh, and the reason for this is because obviously it has implications in terms of treatment for patients that we think are ulcerative colitis but would ultimately convert to Crohn's disease and particularly around uh, surgical treatment. So um, uh, the findings from this study are that um, patients who um, do convert from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease, and this is one in six patients in this particular cohort, were more likely to be smokers compared to ulcerative colitis. They also had a higher risk of developing extraintestinal manifestations, and this was the case compared to both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And if you look over on the right, you can see the table, which indicates the odds ratios of any intestinal man manifestation compared to ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. They also found that patients who uh, did convert from ulcerative colitis to the diagnosis of Crohn's disease had high risk of primary and secondary and non-response anti-TNF therapy compared to Crohn's disease, and this is shown down the bottom of the table. And finally, in terms of serology, um, the, these patients that converted from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease had almost an intermediate, um, in intermediate serology. And if you can see on the left here, um, uh, the red is ulcerative colitis, the green is those patients that converted from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease, and the blue is Crohn's disease. And you can see that compared to ulcerative colitis, the anchor levels are um, lower uh, than ulcerative colitis um, and, and higher than um, compared to Crohn's disease. So see, there's like an intermediate, um, as I said, serological subtype. And again, if you look at ASCA, um, it's also that in um, ASCA, they uh, have a higher level of ASCA than patients with ulcerative colitis, at a lower level than patients that have Crohn's disease up front. And this is also the case for other uh, serologies. It's again, an intermediate phenotype between intermediate serology um, compared to ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. And you can see that shown here, although we're not able to check these other serologies um, in, in uh, Australia uh, in routine clinical care. So um, essentially to conclude, Patients that do convert from ulcerative colitis to Crohn's disease do have a high risk of extraintestinal manifestations. They have distinct serological patterns and a high rate of non-response to anti-TNF agents. And this is a retrospective study from um, a Australian study from um, Adelaide, Royal Adelaide and Flinders um, in South Australia. And please, if anyone from those centres uh, is on the line, please by all means uh, make any comments you feel. Um, and the question here was actually trying to understand whether the presence of adenomas themselves um, independently affect the risk of neoplasia in patients that are undergoing um, su uh, surveillance for IBD. So we know that the guidelines um, currently in HMRC guidelines are um, based more on, um, on the actual state of the IBD. And in there, they talk about family history of, of adenomas and colorectal cancer. They don't really talk about actual adenomas themselves and how that influences potentially surveillance of our patients. Um, so how they've defined advanced neoplasia in this study um, is anyone that's uh, presented, uh, subsequently had colorectal cancer, dysplasia, or an advanced adenoma, and that's defined as a, 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 an adenoma greater than a centimetre or with tubulovillus um, pathology. So the program, surveillance program has been going from 1998 to 2020. They've had five and five, 556 IBD patients, of which 44% um, are ulcerative colitis. The follow-up's been 
69.6 months and uh, four, over 4,000 patient years. What they found, this is shown on the right, and I think I look particularly at the multivariant analysis, that if you had a non, uh, you had an increased risk of developing advanced uh, neoplasia, um, if in on multivariant analysis, if you had a non-advanced adenoma at baseline, or if you had advanced adenoma at baseline, or whether you're aged over 50 years, 55 years of age. Um, and so essentially in terms of the question, the, the aim of this particular paper, it does appear that having an, an non-advanced adenoma or advanced adenoma at baseline does increase your risk of, um, of uh, advanced um, neoplasia subsequently and subsequent colonoscopies. And we can see that uh, here on the right. Other risk factors they found for advanced neoplasia was older age and also long-term prednisolone use. And you can see the odds ratio here on the right of 4.5. But presumably this is related to, um, this is a rep representation of poor disease control. And, and this is sort of reflecting the pre ongoing prednisone use. And also of note, um, there was no increased risk of advanced neoplasia in patients that had used biologic immunomodulator or 5 amino salicylates. In fact, it's almost protective. I mean, it's not significant, but um, certainly um, in terms of biologics, it's looking a little bit like that, but as I said, not significant. Um, <clears throat> So essentially, this is summarised down here under, under the conclusions what we've just discussed. Uh, this is um, a post hoc analysis of the phase three varsity study, um, which compared um, vedolizumab and adalimumab head to head in ulcerative colitis patients. And what this particular study was looking at is a relationship between week 14 fecal carprotectin and clinical endoscopic and histological outcomes at week 52. And how well a week 14 fecal care prediction can predict clinical endoscopic and histological outcomes at week 52. There are um, 634 patients uh, in, uh, that were looked at. And what they defined as a normal fecal calprotectin was under 250, which of course is quite high for us when we're looking when we're thinking of remission in, um, in ulcerative colitis. Um, but that's what they looked at in terms of the fecal car protecting cutoff. And what they found was that patients who had a fecal car protecting of less than 250 at week 14, that they were more likely to be in clinical endoscopic and histological remission at week 52, with an odds ratio of 4. Point, uh, just over four for clinical, 4.2 for endoscopic, and 6.4 histological remission at week 52. And the predictive value was, very, was similar to mucosal healing at week 14. Um, you wonder how many of the patients who were analysed had a much lower calprotectin than 250 um, because, um, as I said, that is quite high. Um, and, you know, certainly um, we like calprotectin is less than 150 um, in terms of our, you know, to, in terms of what we call, you know, remission and even lower than that if possible, uh, you know, below 100. But um, anyway, yeah, this is, as I said, what was the cutoff in this particular study. But if you wanted just to look over here on the right, and the outcome at week 14, this is the light blue is calprotectin at uh, under 250 at week 14. And then you've also got mucosal healing, which is the red using histological remission based on the robots histological index of less than three. And the dark blue is mucosal healing based on histological remission of a, of a Gerby score of less than two. And in both cases, also endoscopic improvement. And you can see how well um, all three markers, the calprotectins, the, um, the light blue and the uh, mucosal healing and the um, in both different categories of mucosal healing, all very similar at week 14 in terms of predicting outcomes at week 52. And you can see the uh, similar odds ratio um, on the right. So essentially, I guess the take home message from this for us is that we, we certainly should be checking calprotectins at least at week 14 uh, in order to predict um, how well the patient's going to do it at week 52. But I mean, we're actually doing it um, earlier than that and um, obviously week eight to just to see how the patient's going following their calprotectin even earlier. This, as I said, is, mentioned, is looking specifically at week 14 and that predictive value. This is the final slide in this current, in um, the first section, and it's um, from the <clears throat> Road to Prevention cohort of Ashkenazi Jewish families. 
study. And essentially, this is a study which was first published um, in um, cellular and molecular gastroenterology and hepatology at that stage. And this is quoted down the bottom. This is written down here. What um, this is basically, um, this is study. This current study is, is 62. Looking at 62 Ashkenazi. Uh, Jewish families, and they, as you know, have a high rate of IBD in their families. The original study was looking at paediatric patients and within these families, and then looking at their stool and blood and clinical data. And what they identified was that patients who had um, IBD patients in a minority of their unaffected first degree relatives uh, had a, um, a dysbiosis state, which was uh, characterised by low diversity. Um, and uh, and that was they called that an operational taxonomic unit type two type of dysbiosis. And they also had similar metabolites as well within this OTU type two dysbiosis, which was um, present in most IBD patients and some of their first degree relatives. Um, and that included the, in that metabolomes, they had things like increased bile acids and taurine and tryptophan. So anyway, this OTU type two. Um, was present in most IBD patients and a minority of their first degree relatives. And then that, this particular study, they've gone on to check, test uh, the stool, blood and clinical data of the 62 Ashkenazi Jew families. Um, and as well as that, they've tested 294, there's 95 IBD patients within, um, these families have two or more first degree relatives with IBD. So 95 IBD patients, a mix of Crohn's, osteoclerosis and IBDU. 294 unaffected family members. It didn't mention the study whether these all these family members lived with the IBD patients, but there are certainly first degree relatives. And then 51 controls that have healthy controls that have nothing to do with the families. And they met, met they tested their stool blood and clinical data. What they found is shown on the right. Firstly, that they, they did replicate the findings from the first study in 2016, and that in that um, uh, there was a, a, a high rate of um, have this OTU type two in um, IBD patients, and it was also prevalent in unaffected first degree relatives, but not so much in control patients. What was also interesting is when this dysbiosis state was present in terms of age. Originally, I want you to look particularly at the right hand side, which is the OT type two um, low diversity state we're talking about, and you can see the age is down on the x axis. Present when uh, in these are in first degree relatives, present initially when they're first born, but then basically gone by the time they're eight years of age, not present then. But at the age of sort of 15 years, this dysbiosis starts to become prevalent again in the population, and you can see it, it rises um, up to its highest level actually in the elderly patients. And that's interesting because that obviously correlates with the age with IBD starts to become. Um, the incidence occurs in the age group of 12 to 15 years of age, or young adolescents, and this dysbiosis score uh, basically replicated, uh, uh, mirrored exactly what I've just discussed here. And you can see, if you look at the age of 12 to 15, as, as 15 years of age, you can see this dysbiosis state, the score going up, showing the dysbiosis increasing as uh, after the age of 15. So suggesting that. Um, uh, this this dysbiosis occurring in late adolescence and potentially might have this these first degree relatives have this IBD associated state and potentially this may be why you know some of these people then end up going on to develop um, IBD. So that's the end of the first session, Miles. Um, have we had any questions at this point? I'm just going to excuse me. I'm just going to blow my nose. I'm just going to put myself on mute. Mike, Miles, any questions? Any questions, Miles? Yeah, no, no questions today, Susie. Um, perhaps we should just keep, um, keep moving on, knowing how much of yeah. the session is on biologics to come. Yeah, yeah. So last night we had a lot of questions in the second half. So we're going to we'll keep moving on then. This is now covering biologics uh, and de-escalation of biologic therapies. So um, first of all, before we we go on with the abstracts just this is just a summary slide um, reminding you of where we're up to in terms of the current treatments available for moderately severe um, IVD and obviously we can see them all here and, and their role in induction maintenance. Um, Lizanamod is now being approved um, in um, in the US for ulcerative colitis and we're hopefully going to be having on PBS very shortly tofacitinib. And these are the emerging therapies some of which we'll be just talking tonight. Um, the anti uh, those anti-IL-23 uh, IL drugs, all three that we'll be discussing tonight, and also Olamcicept, which Miles will be talking about tonight, and then we'll be discussing the JAK1 inhibitors and the CIP receptor modulators next week.
Um, before we go on with that, first we're going to talk about discontinuation study, um, which essentially um, this has been conducted. It was a randomised control trial conducted in uh, multiple sites across Scandinavia. Patients, um, this is looking at the question of patients um, comparing patients who continued infliximab versus patients that stopped infliximab and what happened in terms of relapse. Um, and essentially, um, these patients had to have had a minimum of one year of infliximab um, and they needed to be in clinical, biochemical and endoscopic remission prior to um, being randomised to either infliximab cessation or not. Um, it's not clear from the study how long they had to have been in remission prior to being able to be included in the study and um, infliximab potentially um, stopped, but they had to be in clinical biochemical endoscopic remission at the time that they were randomised. They were allowed to continue comp commented immunosuppressants. It's not, not clear in the um, where the 6GGN levels were mentioned, nor what the um, what the minimum dose of methotrexate was, if they were methotrexate. The primary point in the study was time to relapse, defined as CDI over 150 or an increase in CDI over 70 or a clinical relapse, and this was at 48 weeks. Um, secondary endpoints included clinical and endoscopic remission at 48 weeks. This was only for luminal Crohn's disease and patients were excluded who were on infliximab for perianal Crohn's disease. There was 115 patients. The mean duration of infliximab was 24 months in the infliximab arm, 21 months in the patients that were stopped infliximab, the placebo arm. More than 50% of patients in each arm were on concomitant immunosuppressants. And at one year, 100% 100 of patients who remained on infliximab were in clinical remission versus only 51% in placebo. And this is similar to what we found in the story, in fact, but you can see this on the left here. You've got the, um, the infliximab continuing arm on the top. This is looking at relapse-free or clinical, um, you know, uh, clinical relapse-free survival. So it's 100% at 48 weeks in the infliximab arm. And the placebo arm is the light gray down here. So 51% um, of um, patients only were in remission um, at, at uh, one year. And also this looks at the combined, the combined clinical and endoscopic remission, which is not shown here in the, um, but um, essentially in clinical endoscopic remission were 87% of patients on infliximab versus only 31% in placebo. The other point also is that concomitant immunosuppressions did increase the time to relapse in the placebo group, but it was still significantly shorter than with continued comparing it with continued infliximab. And that particular line is the hash green line here, which is patients that stopped infliximab, which continued immunosuppressants. And you can see that it, the time to relapse was longer than those just on um, that went on concomitant immunosuppressants, which is the bottom line here, but it's still not as good as continuing infliximab. So even in, in patients that have combined clinical, biochemical and endoscopic remission, discontinuation of infliximab and Crohn's disease leads to a considerable risk of relapse. And so this is now a study that we can certainly be talking um, to uh, with our patients. The next three studies look at um, the um, uh, IL-23 uh, trials that are currently ongoing. And, and in each of these trials, um, they have an, uh, use an antibody which um, uh, is, inhibits the P19 subunit of IL-23. And that's the case in all these three different agents. The first one we're talking about is Rizankizumab, um, which is the only of the three trials is the only one that's in phase three. And there are two trials advanced. The patients have uh, either been exposed only to conventional therapies or to biologics, motivate where there's only previous exposure to biologic. Patients have to have moderate to severe Crohn's disease uh, with a simple endoscopic score, uh, endoscopically of over six or over four if it's early limited early disease, as well as a CDAI. Patients were randomised to placebo or 600 or 1200 intravenously of rizankizumab four weekly. And this outcome is looking at the outcomes at week 12, which was clinical remission and endoscopic response at week 12. And essentially, um, the, and this is the numbers down here that were given um, placebo versus rizankinumab uh, in the 600 or 1200 um, uh, groups and 95% um, of patients are completed induction. As I said, this is looking at the week 12 data. And if you look on the left, the, this is looking at the CDAI clinical remission on the left and endoscopic response on the right. 
and um, the Rizan Kijimab 1200 is the dark purple and the light purple is the 600 and essentially you can see that the rates of clinical remission on the left and endoscopic response were greater with both the 600 and the 1200 milligram arms of Rizankizumab compared to placebo, placebo and the bio-naive patients and that's the, um, these are the ones that if you look on the right on each one, so these means the IR means inadequate response to biologics. So essentially the, um, excuse me, the bio-naive patients, which is these guys here on the right, basically had superior outcome compared to the biologic um, exposed, which are the ones on the left on, in each graph. Um, and essentially um, the adverse events were not significantly different between the risen Kijimab groups and the placebo arm. Um, and essentially um, this concluding conclusion from this, the induction arm of this phase three study is that risen Kijimab induction uh, with 600 and 1200 milligrams intravenously, four weekly, um, is more effective than placebo at inducing clinical and endoscopic uh, remission, clinical remission and endoscopic response at week 12, irrespective of uh, previous biological exposure, although previous biological exposure, which uh, did include not only ET and effort, vedolizumab or use of I think 25% of patients had previously had used um, uh, um There is still effect with, um, with uh, if you've had biological exposure, but not as good as being naive. So we'll obviously wait next year for the um, the week 52 outcomes, which, which will, uh, the maintenance study, which hopefully will be through this time next year. The next two study, the next two slides are on the phase two studies. Firstly, for Miracuzumab, um, looking again at moderately, also in moderately severe um, Crohn's disease, again, uh, targeted against the P19 subunit. This is uh, the phase two serenity study. Um, patients in the induction arm were um, randomised two to one to one to two across four treatment arms, which is placebo, 200, 600, 1,000 milligrams of mirocuzumab, four weekly, and and then essentially the and essentially it was shown uh, in the induction arm, sorry, in the induction phase of the study that the um, mirocuzumab um, was more effective than placebo. This is now looking at patients who did achieve more than one point improvement at week 12 in the endoscopic score. They were then assigned basically to ongoing uh, in, um, intravenous four weekly uh, mirocuzumab or 300 milligram subcut four weekly. And this is basically looking at their outcomes, endoscopic response remission at uh, week 52. And they've basically pulled the IV doses because it's only small numbers. We're talking like, you know, 41 and uh, 46 numbers. 46 in the subcut arm and 41 in the IV arm. And essentially, if you look at the um, response, uh, it was 58% in the IV arm and 58.7% 50, uh, of endoscopic response um, in the subcut arm. And remission rates are shown here on the right. Um, interestingly, among patients who didn't respond after week 12, they were further responded by week, uh, week 52. And the safety, um, one patient in each group discontinued adverse events, but they were um, similar in the IV in the subcut dose. And essentially what it this shows is that there's a durable endoscopic and symptomatic improvement with mirocuzumab and that and, um, therefore supports the phase three program, which is known as VIBID. So watch out now for the phase three program for mirocuzumab. And finally, this is looking at gazelkimab, which is, um, uh, this is the galaxy phase two studies. And this is looking at basically the induction arm in this case, patients were randomised to placebo one-to-one -one or 200, 600 or 1,200 milligrams IV four weekly of gazelkimab or a standard use of kinumab uh, IV at week zero and then subcut at week eight. And looking at endoscopic and biomarker results after 12 weeks of induction therapy, and there was, there's 250 patients en enrolled. And essentially, you can see the results here on the right, which shows this um, the improvement in um, the simple endoscopic score of Crohn's disease compared to baseline, at baseline comparing to week 12, and the gazelki map, the pool gazelki map, is the second. The combined group is the second last from on the right. Usikini maps on the far right, and placebos on the far left, and you can see um, that there's greater endoscopic improvement across. Um, all arms of um, gazelkimab compared to placebo and similarly endoscopic healing as well was better in all gazelkimab arms and obviously similar to use to kinumab um, and also that similarly the, there was also mirroring in these endoscopic results also CRP and fecal calprotectin and the response is not dose dependent above a dose of 200 milligrams intravenously 
And um, so essentially these, as we said, is the induction results. And now we'll wait for the, um, the phase two and the phase uh, three results for Giselkimab. And of course, in all these studies as well, they may also be considering using it in uh, separate studies for perianal disease, but this is looking specifically at luminal disease. And now I'm looking at a, um, this is a um, single centre study looking at the question of effectiveness of tofacitinib and ustekinumab in patients who've, um, with ulcerative colitis who's, who've failed an anti-TNF agent and um, vedolizumab. It's a retrospective cohort study from Boston um, in this um, particular uh, study. Um, they were the patients with propensity score matched. Um, the patients that received either tofacitinib or ustekinumab following failure of anti-TNF and endocrine failure. And essentially, um, it, it were, the aim of the study was to assess steroid-free clinical remission at 12 to 16 weeks, um, which is a reduction in baseline SCCAI, so simple chronic disease activity index of more than two points, and also looking at collectomy-free drug survival. Um, as I said, they were propensity score matched. It is obviously only small numbers. But, um, and there were 45 in the TOFA group and 36 in the ustekinumab group. But essentially, there was no difference in um, the treatment arm and steroid free remission. And you can see that over here on the right 44% of patients with tofacitinib and 40% of patients on ustekinumab achieved steroid free clinical remission uh, at 12 to 16 weeks. And so no difference between the two different treatment arms. And similarly, if you can see down the bottom on the Kaplan-Meier curve, that there was no difference between the two drugs in terms of colectomy-free survival down here. Um, there was an increased percentage of adverse drug reactions and infections with tovacidinib, but it was not statistically significant. Um, so this gives you us a hint that um, certainly we should be considering tovacidinib and ustekinumab, um, both equally effective, and about 40% of patients did um, achieve uh, steroid-free clinical remission at 12 to 16 weeks following failure of ATNF and integrin therapy. But of course, um, we can't really make many conclusions in, in terms of which drug is more effective, given that it was, there are small numbers, but I guess it does confirm that we, we should be trying these, uh, these drugs in the context of failure of ATNF or our anti integrin um, in UC patients. The final two uh, slides for my session are looking at uh, multiple switching for um, infliximab. Um, and um, the first study is from, um, both these studies are single centre studies from Edinburgh. The first study is looking at patients that have uh, switched. So these, this um, centre, uh, all patients switched from Remicade to Inflectra in 2016, and then to the first quarter of 2020, they then brought in Zesley, another biosimilar. Um, so this is looking at patients that switched from Inflectra uh, on to Zesley, um, and there were 229 patients. 162 had undergone just a single switch from Inflectra to Zesley. 62 patients had undergone a double switch. So initially were on Remicade and then switched to Inflectra and now on to Zesley. And then essentially on the, on the right, you can see the biochemical the clinical and clinical outcomes. Biochemical remission is on the left. This is at week 26 of being on Zesley. And essentially, there's no difference between bi in biochemical remission in fecal biomarkers. And this is fecal coverage of less than 250, nor clinical remission at uh, baseline and when week six, week 26 is switching across to Zesley. Uh, and so drug, persist drug persistence was also sustained. Um, in terms of uh, antibodies and drug levels, um, you can see the single switch group on the left here on the table down the bottom, table one, double switch on the right. Um, Pre-switch antibody, 13.6% and 16% um, prior to actually switching in post-switch antibodies. Um, in fact, in the, Zez, the double switch group, 6% um, actually um, lost antibodies uh, and 7% had antibodies persisting. So that's interesting. There were no new antibodies developing in the double switch group and new antibodies developed in about 3% of, in 3% of patients in the single switch group. So adverse events, there were um, infection was the most common, two stopped uh, infliximab permanently. So essentially, um, there was no difference in clinical and biochemical remission found between the baseline in week 26 and the single and the double switch cohorts. And <clears throat> single and multiple biosimilar infliximab switching appears to be safe and has no negative outcomes in, in terms of clinical outcomes at six months. <coughs> Excuse me. 
And finally, um, this is looking at, um, this is a relevant for us obviously, because we've just uh, got um, biosimilar adenine maps in Australia. And this one's looking specifically at the biosimilar in Raldi. Again, a study in Edinburgh. Um, this is a retrospective observational cohort study of all the patients who were treated with adalidumab underwent elective switch to um, Imraldi. And what was in, in, important was that was, this was irrespective of IBD phenotype, so UCL Crohn's or IBDU, irrespective of disease activity or adalidumab dosing. And in fact, um, patients, 62% uh, were on second weekly adalidumab and 37% were on weekly adalidumab. Um, about 89% of patients were Crohn's disease patients, so the vast majority had Crohn's disease, and 46% had had prior um, infliximab, so there were 228 patients. And you can look over here, this is looking at week 52 on the right, so the, the, the disease activity on the right here in the circle. You can see the, uh, the red is CRP, blue is fecal cow protectin, and, and the, are, the yellow is clinical um, scores, and essentially no difference between baseline across to week 52 in these three different items. Um, <clears throat> Anti-drug antibodies were present at 11% of patients at baseline, 14% at week 26, 24% at week 52. There was a slight increase in um, any drug antibodies at week 52, but no corresponding, at least week 52, uh, effects on clinical outcomes or biochemical outcomes. 35% of, 35%, sorry, I beg your pardon, 35 patients, so about, uh, about a sixth, underwent a double switch from Humira to SB5 to ABP501. It was all due to side effects and no any drug antibodies developed. So certainly in terms of switching to SB5, it doesn't appear to affect treatment efficacy and safety at least out to 12 months. So it's reassuring, at least for this adalidumab biosimilar. We'll obviously wait to see the, uh, the results from the other um, biosimilars, because um, of course there are four of them um, that we want to see switch results on. So Miles, that, that's the end of my half. How are we going in terms of questions? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, great job, Susan. <laughs> some uh, interesting questions that have come through. There's uh, a couple that um, regarding the name and infliction of this continuation study. One from Arun Gupta. Arun's asked, Susie, gratification of patients. Uh, Miles, would you, mind, would you mind leaning forward a little bit? I can't hear you. Okay, I'm just gonna, sorry, I'll just try my iPods again. One sec. Um, the, uh, the question from Arun Gupta Suzy was, was there risk stratification of patients who underwent discontinuation of infliximab, e.g. endoscopic remission? Oh, well, uh, basically everyone was in endoscopic, oh, you mean like in terms of degree of endoscopic remission? Well, essentially I just said everyone was um, in endoscopic remission. They did stratify in terms of concomitant immunosuppressants, but they didn't know there was no, they just said everyone was in endoscopic remission. They didn't say like if they, ch if they you know, looked at, you know, which, you know, um, what, like if they were is zero or four or whatever. No, they didn't say that specifically. That was just, sure. I think it had to be under under two. I think it was oh, little, I, I can't remember, but it was like endoscopic remission. I can't remember exactly what the, um, the exact definition was, but I mean, presumably under four, but yeah, under six at least. Anyway, I don't know the answer to that. And then there's a question, a couple of questions from Jake. Maybe if, uh, I'll ask you the first one, then I'll try and get the second. Um, yeah. yeah. A Scandinavian trial, 100% clinical remission in the arm, continuing infliximab is very impressive. Uh, were there yeah. any that performed in the study at the time of discontinuation? Yeah, that, those those results are still to come. They did make a comment that those res, the, the the rest of those results are still to be um, to be uh, published or you know presented, and also also the endoscopic data and, and as well, the rest of the endoscopic data is still to be presented. So all that's coming basically. They have checked them; it's all coming. And were there any other factors associated with recurrent disease activity in the discontinuation group? Uh, not that I'm aware of at this stage, no. Okay. And look, um, Jake's put another comment in that I might uh, yeah. answer. Um, yeah. With Prisentizumab and um, uh, Gaselkimab, it seems yeah. that there's not much benefit in higher doses. This is different than our experience with Delara. Do we think yeah. that P9 inhibition might be more effective in targeting P40? Jake, my yeah. feeling is probably yes. Um, yeah. If you look at dermatological data, you know, the 
P19s sort of blow the P40s out of the water in psoriasis. And, you know, mm. I think our implication is that these will be equally and perhaps more effective drugs in IBD and possibly even safer. You know, there are some, uh, there are some uh, detriments to blocking IL-12, which you don't do yeah. with P19. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll change over. Any other questions, Miles? Uh, no, that's all the questions, Susie. So I'm going to hand over to you now. Okay. Um, good evening, guys. Thanks very much for joining us. My apologies. I think there might be my audio might be a little bit scratchy. Um, so this was one of our headline studies. This was C-View. This is a head-to-head -head study in Crohn's disease comparing outcomes with adalimumab to istekinumab. So this is analogous to varsity uh, in ulcerative colitis, albeit with different drugs. So what was um, uh, interesting in the cohort here, these were all biologic naive patients that were failing or intolerant to conventional therapies that had endoscopic activity of disease. It was early onset um, Crohn's disease, a median duration of two and a half years. It was a one-to-one -one randomization to the standard registration doses of both ustekinumab and adalimumab. This was a monotherapy study, uh, as we discovered in discussion last night. These patients weren't on immunomodulators. It's not really reflective of our practice. There was no therapeutic drug monitoring. There was no dose optimization. This was just A versus B in registration doses. It's a nice big study. Um, there was uh, almost 400 patients, about 190 in each arm. If you see here the primary endpoint, looking at the bottom left of the slide, um, of CDAI of less than 150. It was a clinical, not an endoscopic endpoint at a year. There was no statistical difference between the two groups. So 65% Stellara, 61% uh, Adalimumab. So, so when you first look at that, and this was a superiority study, it was uh, aimed to show that Ustekinumab was superior. You might be somewhat disappointed or the sponsor may have been. However, I guess in Crohn's disease, to be shown that you are equally as good as an anti-TNF when, when used first line uh, is a very positive thing, I think. And you can see here, looking at the CDA-I scores, tracking here at the, the bottom right, right through the year, you know, there was really no um, spread between the two drugs at all. Um, the secondary endpoints, and, and there were a lot of them, again, the trends here that there was some very slight numerical advantages for use to kinemab, but not reaching any statistical significance. I won't reach the, read them all out because they're here. But a few of the things here was that, um, you know, the, there was a slightly faster onset without a limumab at week 16, maybe not a surprise there. Some of the endoscopic data was slightly favouring Ustekinumab. And if we see here at the figures over on the right, you can see that actually there was a statistical difference, albeit with an, this is nominal p-values looking here, at the SESCD change uh, from baseline at a year between the two drugs. Nominal p-values are not as strict a definition uh, of a p-value that we'd normally use, but there's a bit of a, uh, a signal here. Where there was some differentiation was in safety. Um, Adverse events were again numerically, but not statistically more common in the adalimumab patients. You can see there were slightly more infections, slightly more SAEs, and slightly more AEs leading to discontinuation uh, before a year. So the conclusion here, this is our first good head-to-head -head study in uh, Crohn's disease. Both of these drugs were highly effective. And a comment I'd make is, you know, this is about a 60% remission at a year. If you think back to the registration studies of both drugs, they were both about 30%. Obviously, where um, here we're treating biologic naive patients and uh, these were, you know, early onset disease, two and a half years. So I think these were overall, you know, really positive results for, for early treatment of active disease and a good result for, for both drugs, including ustekinumab.
Sticking with um, ustekinumab now and this question that we have of where do we position our biologics given that we've got multiple therapies. So this was a, a Crohn's disease study in patients with Crohn's disease who'd failed anti-TNF therapy. It's just a retrospective study. It was multi-centre. It was from France presented by Anthony Buisson. They, this was comparing outcomes between Istokinumab and vedolizumab, as is done in observational studies now, propensity score matching was done to compare the two groups and make them comparable. The primary endpoint was a clinical one. It was steroid-free remission at a year. They had some normal secondary endpoints. Nice cohort sizes, about uh, just uh, over 300. Pretty sick group, almost three quarters of patients had it failed at least two biologics, two anti-TNFs before um, moving on to this drug. And if we look at the primary endpoint over here on the right, there was superiority shown 50 versus 40% for ustekinumab. Um, time to treatment discontinuation or failure was shorter with vedolizumab than ustekinumab as well. So this matches up with the, the Dutch data, a large cohort that they've got. And this seems to be the way the algorithm of anti-TNF failures in Crohn's disease is evolving. They then tried to look on a multivariate analysis and um, uh, at were there any predictors of which patients do better on either drug. The first thing was that there was nothing that they could predict that independently favoured vedolizumab in this, in this group. This is obviously not to say there's not a, a role for vedolizumab in Crohn's disease, there is. Um, but when they looked at ustekinumab, the, they found that it was better and it differentiated itself in the patients with a, a non-complicated and inflammatory phenotype. And, you know, the slightly less unwell patients, those with no resections, no steroids at baseline, there was no safety difference here. So conclusion here was that in anti-TNF patients, uh, Crohn's patients failing an anti-TNF, ustekinumab was more effective than vedolizumab, bearing in mind the caveats of a retrospective study. Some more ustekinumab uh, data here. This is looking at the outcome in extra intestinal manifestations um, with using ustekinumab. So this was from Cornell in New York. It was again, just a retrospective study, small, only 70 patients, but this is some, an area where we don't have a lot of data. Um, these were patients that were given Stellara for luminal disease. And the, the question here was, well, how do their EIMs do if they've got them as well? Of those with the, the EIMs, two thirds were rheumatological, a quarter dermatological and 10% ocular. And of them remembering the drug was given for luminal disease, two thirds of patients, the extra intestinal manifestation was active, a third it wasn't. And when you look overall, and if you look at the column, the second from the, the left here, overall with extra intestinal manifestations, a third resolved, a third improved, and a third, there was no change. Um, what was interesting was that the dermatological EIMs responded better, almost two thirds, versus rheumatological a quarter. They didn't differentiate which rheumatological ones they these were. There was a trend that patients um, whose the drug worked for their bowel, it worked for their EIM, and on their multivariate analysis, the sicker patients on steroids had a lower response. So suggesting to us there is a role for Stellara for extra intestinal manifestations, especially dermatological ones. Moving on now to this important topic of immune mediated diarrhea and colitis or checkpoint inhibitor colitis and two studies here. We, we highlighted this as one of our top three messages from DDW this year. This is a, a retrospective observational study presented out of Sloan Kettering in New York, but with other centres in Europe and China. And they were looking at just colitis and the outcomes of checkpoint inhibitor colitis, comparing infliximab and vedolizumab. And they also looked at cancer outcomes, including cancer progression and overall, uh, overall survival. About 150 patients altogether. If we look at the table on the left, first, clinical remission rates were identical uh, between the two drugs. Not surprisingly, the anti-TNF worked faster, but everything else favoured vedolizumab. This study included both inpatients and outpatients. Uh, there was less hospitalisation with vedolizumab. The duration of hospitalisation was less. Um, there was less recurrence of the colitis with vedolizumab. And interestingly and importantly, there was actually less cancer progression at the last follow-up. And if we look at the survival curves over here, we can see this differentiation in overall survival from um, a malignancy in the vedolizumab versus the infliximab patients. 
Now, this is retrospective. There's lots of caveats to that. It was acknowledged last night that, you know, propensity matching wasn't done, whether patients that got infliximab, just the sicker ones. But I think we're starting to see there really is a role for vedolizumab in the management of checkpoint inhibitor colitis. And this was associated with a reduced duration of hospitalisation, a lower recurrence of colitis and cancer progression, and overall higher survival. If we look now at, at another study, this was out of MD Anderson um, tex, uh, in Texas, which is a big cancer, cancer center, a smaller single center retrospective study, asking the question of if patients, if the oncologist wants to continue treating with the checkpoint inhibitor, do our patient, the patients that get colitis need ongoing maintenance therapy with a biologic, either infliximab or, or vedolizumab. So this was 100 patients who'd had a checkpoint inhibitor colitis that was treated with vedolizumab, uh, uh, treated with steroids and either drug effectively, and then about half of them continued on their checkpoint inhibitor therapy uh, and were treated with ongoing drug. In three, in three quarters of those patients, it was uh, vedolizumab. And you can see here results are over on the right. Not surprisingly, this is looking at colitis recurrence. It's not malignancy recurrence, but the patients who had maintenance therapy had um, significantly less recurrence of their colitis. This also allowed them to tolerate longer courses of immunotherapy, but there wasn't a survival benefit shown here. You know, a small retrospective study. This is a, a question that our oncologists always come to us especially when they're wanting to treat ongoing melanomas with further therapy. Well, can you get a drug to prevent the colitis that's worked first time? You know, as we all know, it's difficult accessing these therapies. Some further data about positioning therapies, and we're looking here at vedolizumab and the, the Love uh, UC study. Um, sorry, excuse me. Just going to bring up this. Sorry, I'm just going to. Yeah, so the Love UC study. So the Love studies are abetalizumab studies. There's both Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis arms. This was looking at Love UC. These are prospective multi center studies. They're open label. This is just essentially a prospective registry uh, of vedolizumab. The question that they asked here was Is there a difference when patients receive vedolizumab early, defined as less than four years, no previous immunomodulators or biologics, or late, defined as both more than four years disease duration and treatment with either a biologic or an immunomodulator? This is standard dosing. The primary endpoint was sustained clinical remission at both weeks 26 and 52. So you can see that the numbers here was about 120 patients evenly split. There was slightly more endoscopic disease in, in the late group. Overall, there was no significant difference in the proportion sustained remission at six and 12 months in the late versus the early 30 versus 42 percent. Similarly, there was no difference um, amongst the patients that by the endoscopic severity. If you look at the figure here over on the right, and this is moving from time is the x-axis here, and then of each of these columns, the left-hand one is early treatment, the right is late. So initially at week zero, patients had Mayo 2 and 3 disease and got the drug. As we move through week 26 and week 52, patients get better, Mayo 0 and 1, but again, no difference um, between early and late treatment, no difference in safety signals either. So it would suggest that in patients with moderate to severe UC, uh, vedolizumab efficacy is not um, differentiated between disease duration, which we can say that, so, well, certainly in Crohn's disease, there are some differences there, especially with anti-TNF therapy. Um, this is the some interesting data from uh, Rupert and Aviv, uh, a petty. Rupert's been really good at looking at our PBS data and analysing uh, that. He's looked at persistence in particular. He's looked at that with his tekinumab and he's now moved on to vedolizumab. And the questions that Rupert and Aviv asked here were they compared first and second line anti-TNF use against first and second line vedolizumab use in ulcerative colitis. So this is an ulcerative colitis data set they're using at, they're, they're looking at looking at PBS data over a five-year period with the outcome being persistence. So nice numbers, over 500 patients in, uh, in here. 
the messages here, and there were two analyses that, that, that were done in terms of first the positioning first or second line. First line, 70% continued vedolizumab as first line therapy versus just over 50 with an anti-TNF. Whereas when used second line, it was reversed, 63% continued vedolizumab and persisted on it versus it was higher and over 80% with anti-TNFs. And if you can see here at the figure, um, figure one uh, over on the right, you can see that the persistence when used first line is higher with vedolizumab, when used second line is actually higher with an anti-TNF, suggesting that there's nothing to lose and something to gain by using vedolizumab first. Predictors of persistence was higher in males, betalizumab using first line, and with immunomodulators when used first line. The second question that they asked then was, do we need an immunomodulator with either drug and when it's first or second line? What they showed was when first line, there was a benefit to immunomodulators for both uh, anti-TNFs and VDO, but for second line, there was with neither, which is shown here at figure two uh, on the bottom. Uh, uh, down here, no difference, suggesting that second line biologics, immunomodulators are, are um, you know, less important. Caveats to the PBS data, uh, as we all know, um, you know, some lack of granularity there, but some really nice work from uh, Rupert and Aviv. Looking now at a LAMCASEP, this is an IL-6 blocker. We don't tend to include phase two studies in the Cornerstone slide tech. Uh, slide deck. Uh, we did this one, it's interesting, uh, it's exciting, it's also been published already in gastroenterology with an editorial this month. Interleukin-6 blocking has been done in Crohn's disease and it was associated with problems in particular with infection um, and with GI perforation. So here they, um, that was blocking which included, and if you look at the mechanism down the bottom uh, of figure two, that included trans um, membrane signaling and that's associated with host defence, acute inf inflammation, and when you block interleukin-6 transmembrane, that's when these, these risks were thought to evolve. What this molecule does, it, it blocks a receptor just insoluble uh, interleukin-6 in its receptor, it doesn't touch the, the transmembrane component of the receptor, and it's felt that that offers a safety advantage. This was a phase two study in ulcerative colitis, comparing two doses, 360 100 milligrams of a lambcocept that are given um, interestingly just twice a week versus placebo uh, with the usual criteria of an ulcerative colitis induction study and week 12 endpoints. If you, we can see here for both clinical remission and mucosal healing shown up on the right, superiority for the 600 milligram dose. And note that this was an uh, easier cohort. It, prior biologic use was very low, only 6%, um, but 600 milligrams was clearly superior. AEs similar across groups and no significant infections or GI perforation. So we will move on to phase three studies in ulcerative colitis for this molecule. Then finishing this section with Strident, uh, this was presented a really nice presentation um, by Julian Schulberg from his work with he and Mike Cam at St. V's. Strident's a study on, uh, medi uh, on stri strictures, it's got multiple components. What they showed here was the medical therapy component in a randomised control study in Crohn's disease patients with evidence of with strictures with an inflammatory component. The, the randomization was to adalimumab just as monotherapy, 40 milligrams alternate weekly, or intensive combination therapy, which was com com combination with an IM, but also intensive where they received 160 milligrams weekly for the first uh, four weeks. There was a treat to target component of this. It was titrated to uh, biomarkers, ultrasound findings. There was an option to increase uh, at four and eight, uh, eight weeks. Um, um, yeah, on that via retreat to target results. The primary endpoint, which was a difficult one for a stricture study, was improvement in the obstructive symptom score at 12 months. So it was symptom-based, not objective. And there, but there were some secondary endoscopic and radiological endpoints. Relatively small numbers at the moment, a one to two randomization to standard to burst intensive therapy. The first comment on results was that the stricture rates were very high for both groups, the response rates. 64% um, in standard uh, therapy, almost 80% in intensive. Um, and, you know, we felt that often strictures needed a mechanical, you know, intervention. You know, the, the guys in Strident are saying if you give enough, 
medical therapy you can win here. 20% of the patients did uh, have a balloon dilatation as well, which is a comment that uh, Julian added last night. Almost half of the patients in the intensive arm did have a treatment escalation. There were some differences. So the primary endpoint in the study wasn't met. Some secondary endpoints were. Rates of treatment failure were um, higher in the standard versus the intensive arm. And then some radiological outcomes reached significance. If you see up here on the top right, improvements in the Mariah score the, and the simplified version, both of which are validated, were better are significantly better in the intensive arm and no safety differences, some numerical differences, but not significant endoscopically. So the conclusion from Striden, although the primary endpoint wasn't met, a treat to target approach um, resulted in reduction in treatment failure in Crohn's disease strictures and better stricture morphology at 12 months. So the first one's looking at the French study, you know, looking at steroid free remission, comparing ustekinumab and betalizumab. And it's from Jake Began asking specifically, you know, the Prevency Match um, uh, study, looking at was there a difference in Crohn's disease, was there a difference in ustekinumab versus vedolizumab in the delta for L1, L3 disease versus L2 disease? So in other words, small bowel or ileal disease versus uh, isolated chronic disease. Yeah, Jake, they didn't show, it's a good question, they didn't show those analyses. The only thing that they, they could show was that inflammatory disease responded better than penetrating or, or fibrous stenotic, but they didn't specifically, um, so, but they didn't break it down anatomically by small bowel versus colonic. And were you saying that the inflammatory disease was better for in the ustekinumab group so, so when you say, so, yeah, so so the only patients in whom they could demonstrate superiority of istekinumab over veto was in the those with an inflammatory versus a penetrating or fibrostenotic phenotype. There was no no group in which metalizumab was was superior. Okay, the next question um, is around the EIM work and um, it's from Gordana Cusette at Liverpool. She says, how does Stellara compare to anti-TNF therapy for EIMs, please? Yeah, a, a good question. Um, you know, I think maybe the way things are on these data, my take is, I think for a rheumatological EIM, I would use an anti-TNF first. For a dermatological one, I would use uh, ustekinumab first. Um, I do think for the joints, anti-TNFs are you know, generally thought to be more uh, effective. Stellara's got some role, obviously, and is registered for rheumatological indications. Um, I think that's the breakdown. But, you know, I hadn't appreciated, it's not surprising this drug, Stellara worked well for, for psoriasis. I hadn't appreciated the response rates for the dermatological EIMs, which is really good to know. The next question is again from Jake, and he said, I believe there are now trials of checkpoint inhibitors giving vedolizumab as prophylaxis. Was this commented at all on at all? <clears throat> yeah, uh, Jake, it wasn't. Um, I wasn't actually, I didn't see this talk live, the ordering one, such that I don't know what came up in the chat, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't mentioned uh, within the talk or, or the slides. Yeah, I'm aware of those studies ongoing. I just think, um, you know, I, a comment that I made and we discussed last night, you know, we're treating most of it, where I work at the Alfred is a really big melanoma service. And, you know, we're telling our IBD patients, you know, there's an increased risk of melanoma with an anti-TNF. When patients get melanoma, the oncologists are, tra are telling them, or oh, we're gonna treat with colitis, as a result of the complication with an anti-TNF, and they don't feel worried about it, but I think we have been. I, I really think we've got to explore the space of betalizumab, you know, for uh, this indication. You know, it's, it's the ideal drug. It's a gut selective without systemic immunosuppression, um, essentially. Um, but I, yeah, they didn't mention it, Jake, but good point. And another uh, question from Jake is in the Love UC study, was there the opportunity to dose escalate? <clears throat> it appears that there is more disease activity at one year than at six months. 
And I wonder if that may be related to not dose escalating. Yeah, no, Jake, they, they didn't dose escalate um, on this and there was no uh, TDM. It was just standard dosing. So your, your point may be valid. And I think also another point um, that we didn't discuss but on Sea View is that, they, that it wasn't so much like real life as well because not only did they not, um, patients were not allowed to be on concomitant immunomodulators in Sea View, but they also did not dose escalate in either arm either in Sea View. So um, this is just a couple of slides finishing population health, epidemiology, quality of life, quality of care and psychosocial uh, and other issues. Um, this is the uh, uh, nice analysis on this question of the association with obesity um, and IBD that keeps coming up, especially with Crohn's disease. And you know, Susie showed some data early showing an association with certain foods in the development of Crohn's disease. What about obesity independently as a risk factor for subsequently developing Crohn's disease? So this was a uh, a pooled analysis of five large cohorts. It was over 600,000 participants, uh, over 10,000 patient years, an international study. Some of these cohorts we know, Nurses Health Study, one and two, EPIC, which is a big European cohort, and then some other Scandinavian ones. They, met, they defined obesity by BMI and waist hip ratio, which are validated. Um, I'll encourage you to come to our webinars next week, which will show that there are some deficiencies in just defining visceral um, adiposity and obesity just by BMI and imaging is a better measure, but this is how it was used for these studies. Um, the first comment that they made was that there is no association between obesity and the subsequent development. So we, what we're talking about here is incident uh, ulcerative colitis, but there was for Crohn's disease. If you look here on the multivariate, if you, if you were obese defined as a BMI greater than 30, there was over a 30% increase in risk of developing Crohn's disease. And for every five kilogram per meter squared increase uh, in BMI, there was a 16% increase in IBD incidence. Then it was even stronger when you looked at the risk if you were obese in early adulthood, a, defined as age 18 and 20, where it was a 48% you know, a, a increase if you were obese and a 22% increase you know, per five milligram, five kilogram per metre squared. You know, this being the age of, of onset of IBD. You know, I think this is uh, really, a, this data is consolidating and, you know, especially in our Crohn's disease patients, we, we have to think of weight loss as a treatment strategy in the same way that we have to, to think of smoking cessation uh, as a uh, treatment strategy. Just obviously observational data, but I think an important message and then finishing up here with this intriguing concept of, is there an association of Alzheimer's disease um, in uh, IBD? So this was, this analysis was triggered by a publication in GART in January of this year of a Taiwanese population-based cohort, which showed an association between having IBD and later developing dementia um, with, with for both with an odds ratio or a hazard ratio of 2.5 in both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So this was an American analysis of the Explorers database that Miguel Ruggiero from Cleveland is analyzing. This is a big commercial database from 26 big health systems. It's not just some of these databases are just insurance claims or prescription claims. It's not that, it's their, more of their electronic health record. Um, these are, it's an enormous database. There was over 320,000 patients with IBD. Um, of which um, there was 2,400 who developed um, Alzheimer's disease. And there was, worryingly, there was an association, it was almost a five times higher hazard risk of IBD and Alzheimer's diagnosis with a, with a younger age of uh, onset of Alzheimer's disease um, uh, as well. It was um, in both, the risk was there in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, a lot was higher in Crohn's effective medical treatment, azathioprine and anti-TNFs were shown to decrease the risk, suggesting that there may be something happening in this um, uh, gut-brain axis that we can modify with therapy. And this was consistent with you know, the Taiwanese data and an even stronger uh, hazard ratio.
um, you can see here, this is just a univariate analysis that they did over on the right, showing the associations, obviously H being the strongest one um, and higher for Crohn's disease rather than, uh, than ulcerative colitis. So again, and just finishing now that, you know, there's a lot of data in these, um, in these slides, but, you know, Susie and I felt that the top three take home messages were that the C-view study, or, although ustekinumab and adalimumab were equal, uh, and it wasn't, ustekinumab wasn't superior, both were highly effective at achieving clinical remission at a year, and adverse events, including infections, were slightly numerically higher in the adalimumab group. Um, there's this emerging uh, data set of the association between processed and ultra-processed foods and the subsequent development of Crohn's disease. We've got some data on dietary interventional studies that we'll present next week in the second webinar, some work from Jim Lewis. I really encourage you to um, join us again next week. And then this really important entity of checkpoint inhibitor colitis, preliminary multicenter observational data suggesting a real role for vedolizumab, including potentially uh, a survival benefit for using this. So Jake said, uh, it would be nice to know if obesity had an effect on Crohn's disease progression, given the association of creeping fat with stricturing disease. I wonder if there's an association with progression to a B2 phenotype. Uh, good, good question, point. Jake. I mean, certainly I think that the association is mainly small bowel disease rather than colonic. Um, whether it's related to you know, um, an L2 phenotype, Jake, yeah, I don't know. It's a good question, it's quite possible. It's really intriguing, Jake, um, what you'll see next week if you can join us on how much we are underestimating the latter possible, in particular when we just use um, uh, BMI and how important it can be um, in uh, determining response to therapies and outcomes. There's some really incredible data that we'll show you next week, um, including some nice perspective work. And I think um, he's, he's actually brought up, this is interesting, Jake, because we discussed this very point this morning in our IBD complex um, case discussion. For both Miles and Susie, do you think IBD physicians would should be treating obesity? Hepatology colleagues starting to get into this space and perhaps we should move, be more proactive as a group and I, we exactly discussed this issue this morning. So I'm ex, we're on the same page there. In fact, our colleagues now, we, we have an obesity liver nurse. That's all, all she does. Um, so yeah, I, 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 um, yeah, I think it's a great point. Do you, th do you think we should be doing it or can our dietitians that hopefully many well, of us Well, the thing is, uh, our dietitian is, we, our dietitian is so busy just giving EEN, um, which she can hardly do anything else. Um, right. So I think it needs more than, more than, um, we just, we just don't have the, our, she's 0.4, she doesn't have the resources to do anything yeah. more. Um, so um uh, I think, well, you know, however we can get the resources to do it. Um, I think we're talking about as a group, you know, not necessarily the we do, but we have a system in order to educate and be proactive. Yep. No, mm. I, think, I, um, I think it's time, Jake. Good point. And I think also we were discussing, you know, this morning as well, um, you know, about the fact that there's obviously this association with diet and, and pathogenesis of, of, of Crohn's disease particularly and, you know, maybe Crohn's disease is, you know, a partly a socioeconomic disease, like, you know, I mean, it's, it's sort of, just, you wonder, like cardiovascular disease and diabetes and, you know, but we need to be thinking along those lines laterally a bit, I think, around, you know, Crohn's and we and, and adjunctive therapy is, you know, a decent diet and, and weight loss mm -hmm. um, as part of our treatment. Yeah. Exercise, yeah. weight loss and, um, and, and a decent diet. Um, it's really interesting, so thought-provoking.